What is up, Brad fans? How you doing? Uh, I got another real dandy here for you because this episode, I was joined by the great Jay Ingram. If you grew up in Canada around the time that I grew up, uh, you will know Jay from TV, radio. Uh, he hosted the CBC radio show Quirks and Quarks for a long time, and then he was the longtime host of uh, Daily Planet, which I believe aired on the Discovery Channel a daily news show dedicated to science. Um, he's really fun to talk to. He's been in the science communication, science broadcasting game for a long time. Um, and he's probably the biggest celebrity to ever grace this show. So I really thank you to Jay for coming on. Um, actually, this is his second time coming on. The very first conversation episode I did on this podcast was with him. So uh, always great to talk to him. He's got a new book out, The Science of Why 5. Great Christmas gift available where you get your books, The Science of Why 5. Uh, it's a question and answer book. So we talked about that and he gave us, he went through uh, a few of the, the questions and answers in the book and it it, it was quite fun. Uh, a lot of interesting uh, questions and, and some, some interesting conversation about animal emotions, uh, flight, human flight, can we fly like birds? Uh, and a fun little one about is your wallet likely to be returned to you with or without the money um, and then we had a really good uh, conversation about just about science communication in the age of the pandemic you know what do we do with misinformation all this kind of stuff and it was really yeah I mean what do you do <laughs> I'm not sure that we had a lot of answers Jay uh, definitely feels like um, if I can paraphrase a little bit here for you I think you should just listen to the conversation um, but yeah that it's a difficult struggle and he made some really good points about um, academia itself not being as open to uh, the public in terms of you know it's not made to be understandable the way that papers are written uh, that kind of thing and it's I think that's maybe where you could put some fault on the institutions on the on academia but it is difficult. There is going to be technical language that, that needs to be used, shorthands and all that stuff. But Jay made some points that make make you realize that maybe it's gone a little too overboard in terms of being exclusive. Um, but it's not entirely the fault of the institutions and the, and the scientists and stuff because they have a lot on their plate already. So then to, to heap, well, you need to be better at talking to the public as well. Um, onto that with no extra sort of compensation. That's something I heard a lot from uh, uh, people when I was in academia. So um, really cool conversation, really interesting. I always love talking to Jay. He's been a real nice help for me and uh, like a mentor uh, in my science uh, freelance journalism communication career. So always fun to catch up with him. He's, uh, like I said, he's been in the game for a while. So he, he knows his stuff and um, is a blast. So, before you get that, you get the usual. Follow us at 2 brad for you Instagram, Twitter, uh, at bvampered on Instagram, Twitter. Get in touch with the show. Let us know your thoughts, your feelings, what you like, what you don't like. If you have questions that you want us to sort of tackle, uh, I'd be happy to do that. I'd be happy to read out your thoughts and questions on the air. Um, and you can email us to get in touch as well, to bradforyou at gmail.com. The website, as always, to bradforyou.wordpress.com. Uh, and then wherever you're getting your podcast, like, subscribe, leave a comment, leave us a rating. Really helps. Um, happy to see the downloads increasing. So I got a better measure of, of how many of you are actually listening and downloading. Well, I let me say a better read of how many of you are downloading. I don't know if you're listening to it, but hey, the downloads shows up on the on the metrics and boosts our ratings. So that's good. That's what we want. Love to get the show out there to more people. So tell a friend, rate, subscribe, do all that great stuff. Hit us up on Twitter, Instagram at too bad for you or on the email too bad for you at gmail.com. That's it, folks. That's it for me. Uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation with the one, the only Jay Ingram. Mr. Jay Ingram, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for taking the time. How are you? 
Well, um, I'm living in a pandemic. How are you? You may be surprised to hear this, but the pandemic is happening over here in Germany as well. Yeah, you know, so it's, um, um, you know, it's worrisome, it's tiresome, it affects uh, mental health to a degree. But uh, given that I was mostly writing uh, anyway, and walking my dog, and, you know, buying groceries, but those, but most of the time I was working at home, which I now like to call living at work rather than <laughs> working at home. And um, uh, so, you know, in some senses, my life hasn't been as dramatically altered or worsened as many people. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't lost a job because I don't really have one. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I shouldn't and can't complain that much. But I'm also in a, a high risk group because I'm older and I have some underlying conditions. So um, I'm trying to be very careful. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it's the transition to to working at home. I, I'm I'm in the same boat as you. Like I'm doing freelance. So a lot of people were when that first happened were like, "Oh my goodness, this is so weird. This is you know." And a few people actually turned to me for advice and be like, "How do you do this every day? Like, how is this you know?" And I was like, oh, "I think a, a really important thing is like you mentioned. Now I'm living at work, but if you have a to make a separate space." You know, so I have a dedicated room that's sort of my office room yep. that I can, you know, so I don't have to, you know, have the TV and everything else in the same room. So when I go to relax, I'm actually going to relax. So do there's you know, a few yeah. things you can do to ch alter your mental health around that subject. But have you soundproofed your room? No, not yet. I um I do a little bit and get like blankets and stuff up when I need to dampen the sound. And I've put some things along the wall along the walls and stuff, but it's not the, uh, it's not the, uh, the home studio yet. I don't plan to stay in this exact building. So. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of podcasters are uh, sitting in a clothes closet Yeah, I mean, and that's not an exaggeration either because having suddenly been forced to be at home, where, where are you going to find a room that you can easily control the sound in? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So that's uh, kind of the way it is. I definitely have, have uh, done some recordings under a blanket. Uh, I've gotten a few, I got a chance to report a story for Undark Magazine doing a pod, you know, as a podcast. And uh, that was a learning curve. And at one point I had to, we had travel plans. And so the, the whole deadline got screwed up and we thought we had the episode in the can. I left on vacation to a, a little cabin here in Bavaria and then uh, got emails coming in being like, oh, we need, you know, there's there's an error here or there. Found myself in the bathroom of this cabin, putting towels up as around <laughs> as much as I could with my little Zoom recorder trying to overdub some sound. So it, it worked out. But yeah, you got to do what you got to do sometimes. Yeah, I, I would. Um, I'm kind of floating in, in my house in terms of finding a dedicated office space because I'm even when I was back doing radio in the, at the CBC in the, in the eighties, um, we had an open office and it was noisy and chaotic. And I learned to be able to work, uh, in that kind of environment. My only stipulation is, or my only advice to people setting up a home office is make sure it's pretty close to the kitchen because that's where the food is. It would, that's my downfall. I had to limit the amount of uh, coffee I was I was consuming because, you know, unlike a communal office or something like that, you know, I'm used to the grad school life. I went from grad school life to this where the coffee was kind of supplied, you know, it was like everybody was fine. But then when it was coming out of my budget solely and a beginner freelance budget, you can imagine, yeah. I started to look at this and be like, well, do I need the premium stuff? Do I need the... Oh, yeah, the but that, that is definitely a slippery slope because uh, one thing I feel pretty strongly about coffee, and I would add cheese to this list, is that bad coffee and bad cheese really aren't worth consuming. It's true. That is true. That is true. I was able to supplement, you know, still keep the coffee at a higher quality and just not drink as much because in Europe, tea is more of a thing. And I finally figured out and I was going to the UK quite a bit to attend uh, science writers meetings with their, um, I can't remember what it's called now, Association of British Science Writers, the closest yeah. English meeting I could go to, you know? Yeah. So I spent some time over there and uh, 
figured out how to do a, a good tea, you know, so that's my afternoon drink. Now I, sh I shift to tea and then of course beer in the evening. So of course I've got the lifestyle figured out. I think, <laughs> I think I've got it. <laughs> if you could drink a stout, uh, an espresso infused stout, you can get a little hit of caffeine in the evening too. Yeah, <laughs> That's probably the last thing I need. I do need to sleep. <laughs> I do need to sleep. So you've been, you've been working at home cause you've been working on, um, the new book, which is out now, Science of Why number five, I believe, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So it's been, a, it's a, this is a question and answer book, which is a well-worn format uh, for science, you know, science questions and their answers. Although given that I've written five of them in a row and there's roughly 40 in each, that's 200 questions. So I've had to go a little further afield uh, than most of these why is the sky blue type books do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'll give you an example of, so, you know, a lot, uh, this is always a blend of marketing and content. So when I read you the table of contents, uh, there's four sections and the names of them are not my choices. They're the <laughs> publishers. So part one is awesome animals. Part two is bodily brain teasers. Ooh. Part three is oddities and eccentricities. And part four is perplexing phenomena. I feel like you could actually take most of these and put them in any random section, you know, yeah. because they're all a little bit perplexing and sometimes odd. But I'll just give you a couple of, uh, a few quick examples uh, to go from what would might be a typical kind of science question that you'd find in a book like this to something that is atypical. So in the awesome animals, uh, I've got, did dinosaurs brood their eggs? Because, you know, sea turtles don't. They just bury right. them. Yeah. Um, but there's really, really good evidence that dinosaurs did. Uh, yeah. And because there's array of, fo there are arrays of fossil eggs arranged in a circle. You can see some sort of imprint. The bigger the eggs, the wider the circle and the bigger the empty. You know, in North America, at least, I'm sure you remember, you can go into a supermarket and get a ring of shrimp, you know, yeah. for a cocktail party. So you've got the shrimp arranged in the perimeter and there's a hole in the middle where you usually put some awful dip. Well, there are lots of dinosaur nests of fossilized eggs arranged like that. And the bigger the eggs, the, the bigger the hole in the middle. And there's pretty good evidence some of these eggs were colored, likely. Um, animals that bury their eggs don't bother coloring them. Why would you? What's the point? Yeah. Uh, so it, it, there's pretty good evidence of that it happened. Do animals mourn their dead? Uh, they're aware of their dead. Crows particularly uh, really react very strongly and sometimes uniquely to um, a, the, a fake body of a dead crow. Hmm. Um, why whales were animals... Too, right? why, sorry, yeah, yeah. There was a famous case of a killer whale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An orca female carried her baby around. See, here's the thing, though. Carried her baby for several months. I can't, I have a reference to it in the book, but I can't remember the number yeah. of months. It was a while. Yeah. 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 And then, and then let it go. So, so the really crucial question is why did she let it go? Was there, because we're assuming in, while she still had it, that she, you got to be very, very careful here about your terminology. Was mm. she grieving? Well, that's conceivable. They're smart. Mm -hmm. But maybe there's just such a strong, let's say, pheromone-based, chemical-based attraction to a newborn Bond, uh, yeah. that, that you would just hang on to it, maybe mm -hmm. in the sort of hope or maybe not even with a hope, just that's what you do. Yeah. And, and then you could argue that, you know, as the chemical bond, because uh, as chemistry changes with death, you might reach a point where that urge to hold on is no longer there. That feedback you know, is on it. So, so conceivably, you could do that whole thing without actually thinking much about it. Mm -hmm. um, people would get mad at me for saying that because we humans want to believe that they can mourn and they feel as we do. This uh, is actually an interesting conversation that I've had a number of times with my wife who she studies behavioral neuroscience. So I would, I would put these same things to her. I'm like, it's got this behavior. But what is the, you know, and at the risk of anthropomorphizing, I always struggle with that word, but you know what I mean? Anthropomorphizing. Anthropomorphism. 
<laughs> yeah. Hey, the... can I just, I'll give you another word. Cause we, a group of us, a small group of us, three or four of us are consider are actively working on starting a podcast, which we're going to, which is based exactly on this idea. Okay. How humans have so much difficulty interacting, thinking about wildlife without projecting our values on them. Mm-hmm. So an orca can't just be doing that for chemical reasons. They have to be mourning, that kind of thing. Where do we ever get that idea? We have no evidence for that. But we're going to call it anthropomania because that's we're easier just for me to say. Crazy about wildlife. So yeah. watch for it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. I look forward to it. But yeah, it's an interesting question. And and through the discussions with my wife, it came out this, that there's like an evolutionary adaptation to emotion. Like it's not just this human based thing where we just kind of ascribe values to it because we have this higher level. Like there's a, there's an argument that there's, there's a reason they evolved. And it's like, kind of like you said, with the chemical thing, like there's a reason that your pheromones or whatever, you would want to be bonded to your infant in order to keep it alive. And pass on the genes, but emotions are sort of an extension of that evolutionary process. I don't know. We so could probably if, go down that road for a while, but yeah. Yeah. So if you're, uh, if you wouldn't mind asking your wife, if she could forward me a reference that actually addresses that issue of the, sure, the evolutionary yeah. value of emotion, um, yeah, cause sure. this is something that we might tackle in some form on our own podcast. Anyway, let me give you a couple of other yeah, um, let's do it. examples. Will we ever fly like birds? Now, hmm. I then amended that when I actually wrote the piece to say, really, the question is, will we ever fly like birds by flapping our arms? Mm-hmm. Uh, even And I would allow uh, extensions on the arms for that. Okay. okay so some fed, kind of a like, yeah, Icarus-like some, device. Something to broaden the uh, surface area. But the fact is, we're never going to be able to do that because uh, birds have an enormous keel bone in their chest that mm. to provide for muscular attachment of the breast muscles. And, you know, the breast of a chicken or a turkey or whatever is enormous, even though they're kind of crappy flyers. But we don't have that anatomy. And people that have done the calculations, even uh, several centuries ago, like in the 1600s, argued that we would need shoulders, uh, you know, two and a half meters across <laughs> and uh, gigantic arms stretching out beyond that. But even so, like the musculature, just our bodies are a little bit too dense. Um, it's a bit of a myth, by the way, that birds' bones are hollow, therefore their bones are lighter. Their bones mm. are not lighter. They are denser. So that combination of being denser but also hollow kind of brings them in in the same weight range as our bones. Mm -hmm. One advantage they do have is they have air sacs in the hollows. So, you know, the other thing that we would have trouble doing is generating, burning the oxygen fast enough to generate the energy to flap our arms fast enough, however augmented they were to stay aloft. So the closest, and so, you know, um, like uh, jet packs, uh, flying suits, all that kind of stuff, squirrel mm-hmm. suits as they're called. None of those are answering that question. The one, there is one aircraft that actually flew human powered by flapping its wings. And it was done at the University of Toronto. Uh, it's it's an ornithopter based on Leonardo da Vinci's uh, design. I was going to say, didn't Leonardo da Vinci have some crazy yeah, yeah. designs of this kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So they, I mean, they didn't follow the Da Vinci design, but they developed this incredibly light. I think it was like uh, 40 kilos or something. I mean, the, and yet it had the wingspan of a Boeing 737. <laughs> so it was just, you know, more than Gossamer because there was a craft that flew human powered called, called the Gossamer Albatross, but it wasn't flapping wings. It was a propeller, was it? Yeah, I think it was a propeller that uh, the pilot pedaled. But in this case, pilot pedaled, wings went up and down, stayed in the air for 19.3 seconds, has never been done since. So I would argue that despite all the attempts, especially in medieval times, to jump, put paste feathers on your arms and jump off a castle <laughs> wall, not recommended. Uh, I like that we can look back in history and find the ancestors of the guys doing the the squirrel suits and stuff, you know? Yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, so what I'm I'm trying to show you, and there are some that are um, 
pretty straightforward, like what will future humans look like? I mean, people have sort of thought about that. There's really very little you can say about that. Is muscle memory a real thing? Well, it's brain memory, of course, not yeah. muscle memory, but still. But then I, I, I found some that nobody's ever asked before, the, to my knowledge, but I found the experiment that answered the question before I thought of doing it as a question. So one of them is, what are the odds your lost wallet will be returned? And huh. this was, this is an incredible experiment, a global experiment where they created little uh, quote unquote wallets. So they were like little plastic um, sleeves um, with, you know, a bi three business cards, a key and some cash. And they, they, around the world, they recruited research associates to have a bunch of these walk through a city and come across, let's say, a police station, an, a museum, some sort of place where there's usually a receptionist, apartment building, okay, yeah. and walk in, drop it on the desk and say, hey, I just found this on the sidewalk outside. I have no idea how it got there. Um, can you take care of it? I got to go. So leave, leaving no instructions, right? Just here's this thing. It's got the equivalent of um, $15 US in cash. So I don't know whether that'd be 10 euros or something like that. Yeah. I mean, in that ballpark. Um, and some had no cash and some had cash. Well, the ones with cash were returned more often to one of the addresses on the business cards, right? With cash Either intact. Email. Yeah, with cash. Good point. Uh, sometimes the cash wasn't intact, but a tiny percentage okay. of the cash removed. Yeah. Um, however, 10 euros, let's just use that as a ballpark. Um, you know, might, that might make it easier to return it. Like mm -hmm. it's not gonna, it's not gonna change your weekly budget. Yeah. So they, they created a small, a subset of big money. So big money was like 90 bucks US. So I don't know, don't know what the exchange rate say, 75 or 70 euros, something like that. Like a, you know, a decent amount of money you could get a few lattes for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, they were returned even more often huh. if they had big money in them. And if there was a key in it, let's set aside the money and just talk. So some had keys and some didn't. The ones with keys were returned more often too, presumably because you know that a key is more important than a business card. Yeah. Right. Like you can the business cards get overprinted all the time, but a key that could be pretty crucial. So so people behaved much more altruistically than I would have supposed, and probably you would have supposed. And even the ex, they they talked to a lot of psychologists, accountants, people like that. They all predicted incorrectly that the money would be taken. Uh, and so I end that chapter with a, a personal experience of my own because I was um, visiting uh, the famous Lake Louise in Alberta and uh, dropped my wallet in the parking lot near the hotel. And I had way too much cash in it. Uh, I would say, yeah, you know, like 150 euros or something like that, like too much. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't carry cash now during COVID at all. I have yeah. zero cash. Anyway, so three days pass. <laughs> so let, let's, let's say it's 100 euros, okay, just for sake of argument. I get a call from the hotel. Hey, your wallet's been turned in. So this was before I know, knew about this study. Anyway, so great, right? I drive back to Lake Louise. It's about an hour and a half from where I live. Um, pick up the wallet, look in it. There's like five euros left. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, they were altruistic. They turned in my wallet. To a point, and yeah. And they took the reward yeah. <laughs> that I wasn't thinking of giving them. <laughs> before they give it back to me. So yeah. I didn't know what, I didn't know quite how to treat this. I was tempted to go on social media and say, thanks a lot. Hope you enjoy the, you know, in Canadian dollars, $235. Yeah, anyway. get a nice steak dinner or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So anyway, but the, this was an interesting point that altruism um, in this experiment anyway, and it, it's, it was pretty true worldwide. That was the other cool thing. There wasn't mm -hmm. a country or a city where people all kept the money. Yeah. The old Canadians are nicer. So they're going to, you know, your, your N of one shows that that's not true. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My small scale version. Yeah. It's an interesting, I mean, I'm in so many things that are happening, you know, today in this charged climate that we're living in and the pandemic and stuff like that. There's so much talk about, you know, that people aren't acting altruistically and stuff. And I've always kind of like held this sort of lofty ideal that like most people are good. And so experiments like this that you're talking about with the wallet and stuff would tend to show that, you know, most people want to help out. And it's really that there's these like large or sorry, small, but loud minorities that sort of skew our, our perception on that. And then I think you could probably make an argument too, that like evolutionarily, you know, we we're we're made to cooperate. Cooperation is our, you know, big plus that we have as a species, um, but that you would have to also be wary of cheaters, you know, so it kind yeah. of, it all kind of, it all kind of makes sense, but yeah, I don't know. I, in terms of the pandemic that we're seeing with the, you know, just people trying to act altruistically, I've seen a few papers talking about this now too, that, you know, this contradiction in, and maybe it's something about epidemics, you know, disease as, as the threat that kind of changes that, but you may have, you may be familiar with some research about, you know, like earthquakes and hurricanes and, and traumatic, you know, large scale disasters like this, that people tend to band together rather yeah. than, you know, dissolve into chaos. But yeah, unfortunately, the circumstances are different because you can see that, uh, well, what would your, what would your conspiracy theory be that would prompt you not to help someone in a hurricane, right? There's, yeah. there's just nothing there. Um, in, in COVID, the, the difference in the issue is that your lack of, one's lack of cooperation endangers others directly. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a good amount of it that's responsible for, you know, huge second waves all over the world uh, has to do more with thoughtlessness, frankly. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, bars are open. Let's go. Well, yeah. You know, I mean anybody realizes that a bar is is a place that's absolutely designed to foster the spread of viruses mm -hmm. and uh, where i live in alberta in canada there's a s strong streak of um, individualism which in this instance has been carried to ludicrous extremes Mm -hmm. where, you know, people will go off the deep end, if you ask me, and say, ah, you know, COVID's a hoax. It was devised by Bill Gates. All of that incredible stupidity um, <laughs> that is getting the way in, in the way of us recovering from this. Those people were always there. Mm -hmm. It's just that there was no immediate crisis that somehow could be interpreted as curbing your personal freedom like they don't bitch about, uh, you know, DUIs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, Deep getting belts. getting a ticket for or jail time for drinking for driving and drinking and driving. Mm -hmm. They don't argue against seatbelts, although apparently when seatbelts were first mandated in Canada, there it were protest movements. Yeah, yeah, I heard that too. I saw that too. Yeah, so you know, there's always a a, a stupid group. But mm -hmm. the stupid group has access to social media, and so their views are amplified now. Yeah. Um, you know, I might, you know, when seatbelts came in, who knows? We might not have even noticed that mm -hmm. there were some idiots protesting it. Yeah. Anyway, the, the same idiots today uh, are perfectly happy to accept the government mandating no drinking and driving. Mm -hmm. So why they, they can't accept a wearing a mask I mean, I, I, they don't, I don't know if there's even an argument that those two are different. I, to me, they're the same. They're no. curbing your personal freedom. You're not allowed to drive without a seatbelt. You're not allowed to drive on the curb, like whatever. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I, I just get incredibly frustrated. And I, I had a friend of mine say something interesting yesterday that he said he, his view is, see, Canadians... For those listening who aren't either Canadian or American, Canadians think they're specially different from Americans. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the Trump years have cemented that view so that they do crazy things. They have racist views. They have guys walking around with AK-47s and 
ordering, you know, their Subway sandwich with a giant effing gun stripped to their strapped to their back. And we don't see that. So we think we're different. Mm -hmm. So my friend said, his theory is, you go to a place like Arkansas, sorry, Arkansonians. Or <laughs> we have a huge fan base there. I don't know if you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> You know, sorry, but like 40% of you are the, these right-wing ideologues that don't think COVID exists, et cetera. And then he said, I think, the same, I think there are people like that in Canada, but it's 30%, not 40. Mm -hmm. And 10% mm -hmm. difference is what saves us. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think we're kidding ourselves to think that we're that there aren't elements of, of the Canadian society that are exactly like, I mean, I see it around me every day. So we're not that different, but mm -hmm. there is a tilt. There's a, a less strong, you know, we have a constitutional right to bear arms, all that kind of stuff. We don't have that. Mm -hmm. And that makes the difference. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I think this is you know, it's highlighted all over. I mean, we're seeing the same things in Germany. You know, there's. I think that just the other week it was ten thousand gathered in Berlin to talk about how masks are, you know, against their rights and all this stuff, and add in every single conspiracy theory you've heard. I'm so it, it appears that this is like the most. I don't. It'd be interesting to know. Again, like in in history, how much of this has you know just always existed? I've seen things, you know, that the 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 same sorts of things happened during the uh, nineteen eighteen flu epidemic and stuff like that. Yeah. So taking that some of this is just going to exist, and that there's obvious caveats that we have now in the way that we communicate with social media and stuff like this. What do you think about you? Know, how do you counter that with messaging? Because this is something I've been like wrestling a lot in my mind about and i think that there's you know you have to of course there's some people that are unreachable there's other people that are getting um influenced by misinformation and the and the rest and i think that there's that there is wiggle room there where strong messaging more clear messaging um could sort of not inoculate the people against misinformation, but provide less room for it to grow, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So th this is, um, I'm not even glad you brought this up because this is a really, really complicated and not yet resolved issue mm -hmm. uh, of misinf how to counter misinformation. Um, so I can give you um, a couple of thoughts on that. I'm actually going to be doing in a few days I'm going to be on a panel talking about um, uh, gene therapy, gene editing, and the panel, this is sort of the culmination of a two-day meeting on these topics with specific reference to Canada. And um, the panel that I'm on is tasked with looking out to, say, 2030 and saying, what are going to be, where are we going to be medically, technologically, um, and what about communication in those days? Well, I'm dreading this because this is like an impossible thing to answer, but it obvious, but what you have to do is take what the knowledge of today and try and extrapolate to what's going to be controversial in 2030 around, uh, let's say germline gene editing, you know, where you can actually alter the genetic development of an offspring. Well, I have no idea, but uh, you can sort of see what's happening now. And what I think is much more obvious um, than what to do is what not to do. And uh, combating, uh, coming, believing that giving people the science is going to change their minds uh, is, should be thrown in the trash. Like that idea never has worked and will never work. Because if you, and you kind of alluded to this, that there are some people that you might not be able to reach. So if you take any scientific controversy uh, from the past or the present, so climate change, GMOs, uh, nuclear power, um, and let's say COVID masking, uh, those four. Mm -hmm. um, each of them is portrayed as a scientific controversy. And when you hear that phrase, you might think, well, that means that people are going to discuss ambiguous data and, and try and evaluate it one way or the other. But the fact is, when you're talking to the general public, 
who most of whom are not immediately intimately familiar with the data, um, it doesn't matter. They're not forming their opinions based on data. The extreme ends, especially, let's say there's a spectrum of belief from, yeah, I've, I've been masked since February of last year. And I'm going to continue to mask. Like, I believe here's all the data about masks. That's at one end. And the other end is it, it uh, curbs my individual uh, freedom. I'm not going to do it. And there's, and there's no evidence for them. Right. The 10%, and so imagine that as, as a smooth spectrum of opinion. The 10% at each end can, I think, effectively be ignored. Because you're never going to change either the strongly negative or the strongly positive. In this mm -hmm. case, we don't want to change the strongly positive, but you know what I mean. Yeah. So uh, the 80% in the middle is where you can affect change, hopefully. So that that's one thing that I would say. A second thing is, which is much more difficult, is, well, how do you do that? Uh, you know, you've got people who are skeptical about masking and do have... You see, the, the important thing is that People import values to this debate that aren't have nothing to do with science. Mm -hmm. They have to do with are they egalitarian, where they they see that a, a leveling of society, more advantage for the more disadvantaged, and less advantage for the super rich, and so on. That would be a good thing. Then there are other people who believe that social hierarchies are perfectly justified. There are people who are communitarian, who feel like like the, the important thing in life is to reach out and help your neighbors. Uh, combating that would be individualism. Uh, you know, my neighbors are responsible for their own life. If they can't manage it, tough. Those kinds of values, if, if you survey a group of people and establish wh where they lie on those, with respect to those values, and then ask them to comment on uh, climate change, you can predict with 70% accuracy where each of those people is going to stand based on not the science, but their social cultural values. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So here we are with masking. Um, how do we address those people? Well, I'm not going to address the people that demonstrate downtown. Like, you know what? I don't care. They're wrong. They don't, they don't know the data and uh, they're not reachable. So I would aim for the people that, uh, you know, think that who are thinking about the data, the people in the middle of the spectrum, who, you know, sometimes vote for a progressive government, sometimes vote for a more conservative government, those people who, who make up their minds based on some new information. And I would, I, I, then I would feel comfortable working with them to inform them and let them make their own decision. You know, there's been a very, very bad tradition in science communication, which I think is over now, but was quite strong for a while, where if somebody disagreed with you, you just gave them more data. Mm -hmm. And it never changed their mind. It just made them usually more polarized than they were before. Um, it's called the, you know, the deficit model, where yeah. you think, you assume they have a deficit in knowledge. Um, that's not arrogant. And, and then, you know, and just say, <laughs> okay, you need more knowledge here. Here are some references for you. Yeah. You, you can't do that. First of all, you... You know, you know, Brad, what, what I like to take as an ideal model is adult-to-adult -adult conversation, which you and I are, at least on the conversation part, we qualify. <laughs> you know, Doing where my it's, best. It, it's, yeah, it's an upward struggle. Uh, <laughs> where, you know, you're, you're sharing ideas mm -hmm. and, and you might challenge each other, but, but you're sharing, you're listening, and you're not going into it with your fists clenched. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as you do, you, you're, you're bound to fail. And, I think that's, and so, yeah, go ahead. Well, I know. I was just going to say that. I mean, that's that's kind of the idea that I had with this podcast of having the conversations like this is you can explore things, you can do stuff like that. I mean, I'm not the first to stumble. I'm not claiming credit or anything from that. And it's something that I think is important because I find myself falling into traps, you know, and I think it's human psychology plays a role in, in this where you know, even me that like, I try and hold myself to that ideal of being open and, and stuff like that. There's certain things, you know, politics, whatever it is, where I have to stop myself and say, okay, why am I getting upset about this? Have I considered the data? 
have I considered that it's just because I don't like this politician and the other things that he stands for, he or she stands for, you know, so it's a really difficult, difficult struggle. And yeah, yeah I'm not sure I, how you do it, how you get it, but like, but, we're but, probably a small percentage of people that think that way though, too, right? Yeah, but I, I think your dilemma may not be quite as difficult as you think, because uh, at some point you have to, you have to set the bar for rational thought, mm -hmm. right? And, and not um, all ideas are worth considering. Great. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so if you take some of the nonsense coming out of the U S you know, where it, I've heard at least two reports of somebody dying of COVID while they're denying it exists. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you know, I. that like, makes me I, chuckle I'm, at least. <laughs> well, yeah, too bad for them. I mean, you know, I'm not interested in trying to communicate with somebody like that mm -hmm, because we mm -hmm. all only have so much time on earth and I'm right. not going to waste it talking to somebody who's just so ideologically bound up that, that they can't even listen. So, what so do you, sorry. You, you know, well, then, then, so I think you do have to take into account, let's talk, talk about a politician. You, you do have to take into account that politician's statements on other issues to see whether, you know, are they actually thinking about an issue? Is it just a knee jerk response? You know, for, I'll give you an example. It has nothing to do with science. Defund the police. Mm -hmm. Now that is a, that is an inflammatory way of phrasing an idea that at the core is not a bad idea, which is take some of a police budget and devote it not to having the police have to attend to a case of somebody that might have a mental illness causing some kind of public disturbance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes that's dangerous, obviously, but often it's not. And instead have people who are trained in a slightly different way, a perhaps less con confrontational, less arrest oriented, mm -hmm. less, um, you know, subjecting people to disciplinary stuff because it might work better. Mm -hmm. But somehow that that proposal, and it's happening where I live, uh, just gets labeled by opponents as defund the police. And then everybody who believes that thinks we're going to not have a police force. It's just ludicrous. Yeah. But it's um, I'm losing faith in uh, politics pretty rapidly these days, which, you know, is not a not a healthy thing, because in the end, uh, politicians do things that impact us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's unfortunate. I feel that as well like i've increasingly feel like i don't have a a political home you know there's not a place on this in the varied options that i have you know and i keep really close contact with canada and what's going on there so let's just use that as a reference point you know where it's like ah you know like i really like I, the discourse is terrible um and obviously you know like you said i agree that you have to look at you know, their whole history of what someone's saying to understand, like, are they just being glib about a, a, a something or just trying to score points or something on it? But I guess that's like, so that's kind of the problem is that the discourse has become so gotcha. So, you know, like whatever we disagree with, we just label it as the other guy's idea. And that point that you brought up about being able to predict someone's views on scientific things based on their social views from the data and the stuff that I've seen, that was, that's kind of a new phenomenon. This is sort of a, it's a gradual process that's been happening. And it's, it used to be that it wasn't so easy to predict that, that kind of stuff. And I wonder how much, well, social media, I think, plays a role in this. But how much of it is the sort of challenges that we're facing, the discussions that we're having in the society now, like climate change is a difficult one you know, because it's not upfront in, in your face. The COVID one, I'm really surprised at that that wasn't, you know, that that's so polarizing. I think that's more of an effective political discourse than it is, you know, maybe if there was a calmer political climate and a little bit better messaging. I spoke to an anthropologist uh, on an episode, a couple episodes back on the show. She was working in, in Sierra Leone in the Ebola crisis about messaging and how that led to people not believing that the Ebola epidemic was a real thing and so i think that there's a way you could do it like depending on the crisis there is a way that messaging could help but yeah i don't know i'm 
I, I guess I'm just agreeing with your uh, your take that it's like losing faith in in some of the discussions that we're having. So I'm, maybe that's to to not be so down is is how do we? I think podcasting is a great way to sort of get to the people that want information that actually want, I think there is a, a, a hunger for information as much as we're seeing this polarization and stuff. My peers, my colleagues of my age, my friends that aren't science people, they're not communications people at all. I see them hungering for information and yeah. debate and rational debate and all of these things. So I feel like there's hope there. Well, those are your friends, right? Yeah, I, I am in a bubble. <laughs> so there you are. I mean, you belong to a tribe. And uh, here's the thing about tribes. One thing is that usually you have many more ties than just your opinions about, say, climate change, right? You have a lot in common with them. If you were to suddenly do an about face and decide that uh, anthropogenic climate change was a myth, a hoax, um, not only would you be stupid, but you'd lose your friends too. Well, like I think they, I'd actually would... be better friends with some of my friends because there is a, there is some pretty <laughs> yeah. uh, we have a pretty diverse opinion set in my group of friends. So yeah, okay, well that that might that's good if you do. Yeah, but you know it's pretty abundant from comments I've seen on Facebook and Twitter that people are canceling friends yeah. because of these views. You know, I would also say that if people had been paying closer attention to controversies in science, and by that I mean, whoa. Uh, maybe even 10 years ago, mm -hmm. you would have seen exactly this being played out in miniature. So um, this whole idea that I expressed of giving people more data and having them become more polarized, that was established in experiments several, several years ago, experiments done with people and their opinions on climate change. Um, who paid attention to that? Academics, because yeah. who cares, right? Um, and all I'm saying is that over the last four years since Trump came to power, um, th that exact mechanism has just been more obviously operating on much more general on a much more general level, and uh, fed by the ability of people anonymously tweeting garbage, mm -hmm. like you know, gutless. You're anonymous, and you, you're. You're giving, you're spraying your opinions around. I have no respect for you, mm -hmm. and and, but you know they don't care that I don't respect them. <laughs> Shit, I only have like fifty five hundred followers on Twitter, so you know I see some outrageous opinion, and I I check out the person, and they've either got twelve followers and are probably a bot, mm -hmm. or they've got like three hundred and fifty thousand, and they're an influencer, mm -hmm. and. You know, that's the situation we face. Yeah. I mean, it would be it would be nice to be um, a science communicator these days, um, delighting people with news from science that's really cool. Uh, unfortunately, this is what it devolves to most of the time. This yeah. is what we've been talking about for half an hour. Yeah, unfortunately. And I mean, that's a, I've, I've, I'm finding in my as I'm finding my way in the science communication, science journalism career, I find that I do gravitate towards not these sort of hot button issues, but my stories tend to be more interest, like what I find interesting. That's what I try to cover, you know, rather yeah. than, you know, so-and-so says climate change isn't real. Here's why it's real. But I mean, I think it's like, you kind of have to, all of this stuff is thrown in her face and I hope I didn't like bum you out with the conversation or anything like that. But I just, it, it is a curious, it is a curious moment. And I think that you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm always optimistic. I'm, I'm always optimistic. And I do see that there's lessons I think that can be learned. Um, you know, we're both aware of Timothy Caulfield. We both follow Timothy Caulfield. He's very optimistic in his science communication, uh, efforts. Um, and I think he would disagree. Yeah, I, I don't know where he's getting his optimism from <laughs> because seriously, uh, the problem is by no means under control. And I, I have a lot of respect for Tim. But, you know, what he's kind of forced to say these days is, um, there, you know, there's some emerging evidence that the so-called backfire effect, when you, you confront mm -hmm. um, what you think is a, an incorrect view, you somehow lend publicity and momentum to that view. 
Um, you know, he's, and that has actually scared people off, I think, mm -hmm. or at least le left them wondering, how can I, how can I combat this illogical view? Well, when, you know, the best you can say is, well, you know, there's emerging evidence that backfire effect doesn't uh, take hold. That's pretty flimsy. And, <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm, um, a lot of this stuff is dealt with in, in science journals. And the, I'll tell you what the emerging evidence for science journals is. Nobody reads them. And yeah. And they're getting more and more opaque. Yeah. So I've, I mean, I just came across a, a flurry of papers showing that from night, get this, from 1950 to 2019, in a survey of, uh, I think more than a hundred thousand, uh, it might even be more than that. It doesn't really matter. There were a million new acronyms coined Ugh. from 1950 to 2019. How many of them are used, let's say, you know, like a good acronym like DNA would be a good example of an acronym? Oh, I was going to say yeah. LOL, but we're, I guess yeah, we're talking, LOL, I guess we're also, talking science. You know, WTF. <laughs> yeah. uh, how many of them in the science literature are used more about, and we're talking from 1950 on, 10,000 times? What do you think? Not many. Like that's not that. Yeah, but what is what exactly do you mean by not many out of a million? Ugh. Use more than ten thousand times in the literature. Yeah, take a shot. A million. Yeah, I'm going to say two hundred thousand, but I feel like that's probably too okay, much. Okay, so so that would be twenty uh, percent. Hmm. No, yeah, twenty percent, right? Okay, yeah. Well, you've got the the numeral right. But it's zero point two percent. So most and and most acronyms zero point two percent, and most of them really are probably never used again. So three researchers got together, said, "Hey, let's let's create an acronym here," and then nobody, nobody, yeah, ever uses it. They're... Okay, so that's one thing. So the literature is full of acronyms that when you get halfway through reading a paper, you, you got to go back to the beginning or find the first reference to it to remember what the hell it was. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Uh, uh, words are getting more difficult. Less commonly used words are appearing more and more. Number of syllables per word are increasing. Like it's just drifting away from the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And now, so you're a science communicator. You have to read scientific papers mm -hmm. and it's your job to make sense of them for a, a, a public who isn't going to read them. So the scientists are making your job more difficult. Much. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. that's exactly what it comes down to. So I don't want to hear any scientists complaining that science communicators aren't doing a good job. You do a good job first. Yeah. And let me just say that demanding that scientists do great communication is a heavy burden because what have they got? They've got research, they've got grad students, they've got funding requests, grants, grant requests that take an enormous amount of time. They've probably got administrative work at their institution. And we're saying, I'm saying, but I'm not saying. <laughs> Do a better job of communication. What, what does doing a better job of communication entail? You were at the Banff program that uh, we used to run. Um, you spent two weeks there not not an afternoon mm -hmm, mm -hmm. doing a SciComm workshop, two weeks, and it was morning, noon, and evening. We believe, and still believe, even though those are kind of on hold at the moment, that that's really the only way to do it because you're not just you're not just learning not to use jargon. You have to think about communicating science in a completely different way than you thought about it before. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. have to think of it as personal. You have to think that you're you're, you're com competing in the media with like everything, you know, everything that's out there that you can gain access to. And so to, to become a better science communicator, it's not a one day, half day workshop at all, mm -hmm. at all. And with no encouragement from universities, like, you know, you get credit somehow for doing your science communication. If the best if the most that you're asked to do is write a quote unquote lay audience abstract, 
that you can put in your grant request that nobody reads, then we're in pretty dire straits. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's a, that's an interesting point to focus on, you know, is, is that making the, the science itself, making it like it's dri- like you, you put it well there, like where you say it's drifting away from the rest of us. I totally agree with that. My optimism would be guys like Timothy Caulfield that are trying to, you know, bring that back and speak. He speaks to researchers as well in, in terms of trying to help this. And you're right. It's not an overnight, it's not an overnight thing. Um, you, you got to spend some time, you got to get some work out and you have to invent, incentivize it for researchers. But, um, I think that there is a way or, can I, there or encourage and don't quibble with people who actually, uh, do science communication like you and me. Yeah. 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 Don't, you don't look down upon it or you're doing it wrong or you're, you got my, you didn't use my acronym. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, you know, don't complain to us that we didn't do it in, in sufficient detail. Right. Exactly. Because our goal is to actually engage an audience, mm-hmm. not turn them away. Well, and I think that that's maybe the point, like that's the point that I see where there's a, there's a disconnect. And if you could get more researchers on board with the idea that, the the messaging the tone of the messaging the the package that the message is put into is somewhat more important than the detail or you could argue it's a, a bit more important than the detail i think would go a long way and this is i i think this is exactly the true with some of this political polarization stuff too you get people that are so resistant to this idea that you know i'm giving you this information because i'm better than you and i'm telling you how things are where instead if you yeah. come at it like a bit more empathetic, a bit more, you know, maybe with some flair or something like that, you can, you can maybe get that, that message across. Do you hear some weird sounds? I do. Sounds like you have an animal caged up there that you need to get out. No, you know what's happening? He's dreaming. (laughs) He's asleep. (laughs) And he's making these weird. (sighs) That'll be the that'll be the invention to the little know, cap on the dogs that we can see what they're dreaming. <laughs> he, it's exciting. It's an exciting dream because it's been going on now for about a minute and a half. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, I probably should take him for a walk. There, there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot. You know what? We're in a we're in a kind of interesting situation now with communicating science about COVID. Mm-hmm. to people who are resistant to that. And I'm not really sure what's going to turn the tide. You know, once a vaccine becomes available, uh, how many of these people are going to turn down the vaccine? Or, more interesting, you've got a group of anti-vaxxers that existed before COVID. You've now got a group of people who don't believe in COVID or think it's the flu or whatever. Mm-hmm. What's the Venn diagram of those groups of people. Yeah. How many of the uh, people who disparage its existence are nonetheless going to get a vaccine just in case? Yeah. Just in case it actually does exist. Oh, yeah. How many of the anti-vaxxers who may actually agree that COVID exists and it's dangerous, how many of them are going to shed their anti-vax uh, attitudes? I really want to see a study of that. Yeah, that'll be I interesting. So. I saw an interesting uh, opinion sort of study in a journal the other day, and I talked about it on the podcast here about the from a bioethicist that was talking about whether we should just pay people to get the vaccine and what are the sort of ethical arguments. And he did a little bit of, you know, sort of it looked like back of the napkin economic calculations as to <laughs> what you could do there. It was interesting. It kind of made sense, but maybe that's where we're heading. It 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 did shake my optimism in humanity that we would have to pay people to get a <laughs> could you send me that reference? I will, yeah, I'd really, sure. I'd really like to read that because um if you choose to accept money to do something, then I don't really see that this abrogates your uh you know individual rights at all. It's your choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. We're just selling you we're selling you two things. That's a bit like buying winter tires for your car. Yeah. I mean, you don't, you don't really want to, but you're buying them because it's going to make you safer. Mm-hmm. Somehow nobody objects to, are there people, are there people who object to uh, winter, like in, in the park? Anti-tireists? 
yeah. Like in Quebec, I think you have to, by law, have winter tires. Yeah. So what? Where are they? Where are those protesters? Uh, hopefully, hopefully not listening to this podcast and getting an idea. <laughs> <laughs> You could, you know, you could, you could uh, wear a tire around your waist and march up and down. Oh yeah, It'd be fun. I wonder if this spurs the spurs the anti everything movement. On. We're just going to see it for everything. You know, every single thing that comes up now, we're just going to see a segment of the population. That, I mean, we could go on about this for for hours and hours because I think there's so many interesting, interesting yeah, but nobody angles. Would, nobody would listen. Well. Just yeah, two well, random guys somewhere on the internet. <laughs> well, you know, what would change from... Except from your fan base. What's that? Except your fan base would listen. Yeah, I was going to say, what would change? You know, I have I have my 200, 200 or so downloads, you know, a week or whatever it is. So, hey, cool. yeah. Hey, it's growing. You'd be surprised what people listen to. <laughs> I probably would. Um, yeah. Well, hey, no, it's we we got to I've had you for like an hour here and there, there was other things that I was I, I do want to talk to. So I hope we can do it again at some point. And maybe it won't be as, yeah, sure. uh, uh, you know, doom and gloom. I hope it wasn't too doom and gloom. I'm still optimistic. No, no, no I'm I'm optimistic, but trying to be realistic in the face of it. Um, but, you know, we should talk again. Let's see. Um, there's angst in Canada now because. It looks like we we don't really have any vaccine manufacturing capacity here. I saw that. Yeah. So we're going to be uh, taking we're going to be second, third, fourth in line. So um, my friends and I have been running an informal poll because I'm more at risk, mostly because of age, than they are. Um, they've been saying, "Oh, you'll get." Uh, oh, I just saw a helicopter going. Over. They um, you'll get it in February. And I've mm. been saying, not because of this manufacturing capacity argument, mm -hmm. just generally the slowness of reaction. I've been saying June. Yeah. I'm going to turn out to be right. I know it. <laughs> and they're not going to get it till uh, late summer. I'm convinced. Yeah. Of that. I, I, It'd be I, nice to be right. It'd be nice. I also told them, look, you're lucky that I'm older and I'm going to get it first because. If there's adverse reactions, yeah. If you grow a tail, then I'm we'll know. going to be the one. <laughs> I'm going to be the one that gets it, and you'll be warned off. Yeah, <laughs> and you'll become anti-vaxxers, all of you. Yeah. <laughs> well, then there'll be more for me over here in Germany. So, great. So we should do it. Uh, we should uh, talk about it again in uh, like April. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, in the meantime, people can get uh, the science of why five in time for the holidays. Yeah. Makes a great gift. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be nice. It's, um, well, what can I say? But it's, uh, there's a lot of entertaining stuff in it. Mm -hmm. I would say that. Mm -hmm. I have version two and I quite enjoyed it. So, And, you know, uh, the, the success of these books has ridden on the fact that people like you read them and like them, but 12 year olds read them and like them too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not a comment on you. It's just a <laughs> comment. My, my writing is kind of, uh, I would say vanilla, but that's not a good word. But, hey. you know, uh, it appeals across a wide... That was the goal in the beginning. We wanted readers 12 to infinity. Yeah. So that's what we've tried it's to do. A, it's an interesting subject for another podcast too, but I've been looking at getting into the science writing for younger audiences, and I've followed a number of articles and people that are talking about, hey, if you can, if you can explain this stuff to kids, you can explain it through and through, you know, so... Yep. There you go. Got to tell interesting stories. Yeah. That's what you got to do. Yeah. All right, Jay. Uh, take care. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks, Brad. Uh, good luck with the podcast and all your other Psycom stuff. Thank you very much. There we go. Jay Ingram. Thank you again for taking the time to be on the show. Really appreciated the uh, conversation. And once again, everyone, you can get the science of why five wherever you get books check it out uh like i said at the end there makes a great gift for all ages uh it's it's one of those fun science books you can pull out you know just pick a page and, and start reading and you'll and you'll get something interesting so thank you everyone for listening uh for following for rating subscribing uh, leaving comments, all of that great stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, it really helps. 
And always, I am open to get your thoughts, feelings, questions at 2 bread for you on Instagram or Twitter or by email, 2 bread for you at gmail.com. Um, yeah, what more can I say? Thank you so much for listening, folks, and I'll catch you next time.